Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Okay, starting in a second, friends. Hello! How are we doing? Oh, I've lowered it way too much. Hi, friends. Hi. Welcome back to Attack the Pantry. I'm Jen De La Vega. This is a stream, a deep dive into ingredients, cooking techniques, and recipes to help you cook for yourself during quarantine and the rest of your adult life. I hope, I wish, I hope. How are you doing? Hi, Martin. <laughs> Hi, Lucius. Oh, we get an emote to thank Lucius for subscribing. Oh, look at that. I don't know what that is. But hello to you as well. Um, last time on the stream, we talked about the history of spices for a long time, and gumbo, fascinating stuff. If you want to watch all the past clips here on my channel, you click on videos, or you can visit youtube.com slash j-e-n-n-d-l-v at another time to catch up on the streams. Make sure to subscribe there. Um, hopefully I'll be back streaming on Sunday about zines. I've had to take the last couple Sundays off for personal reasons, but hopefully this Sunday I'll be free. Uh, hooray. I've been having a lot of fun on Twitch Sings. <laughs> Thanks to Lucius for <laughs> introducing me to the world of online duet karaoke. <laughs> you can see some of the archive here on uh, the Twitch channel under my uploads. Uh, <laughs> it's been really cool. Uh, what else has been happening? Uh, lots of really good links below the video if you'd like to support the stream and help me keep it going. I have tons and tons of cooking related projects and videos and things. You can click around there another time. Uh, Patreon. So what's been going on there? I'm making lots and lots of stuff. 
Uh, this on Monday, I had a skate video number twenty-seven where I start wearing a helmet. Uh, I want. <laughs> I don't want to repeat myself, but you can you can watch that video for the reason why I'm wearing that helmet. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think you could see it, but I have I have fallen a couple times. Um, anyway, a uh, new episode of Fun Float City, Fun City's mini series is called Float City, and it's coming out this Friday. I believe we're going to be on episode three. Um, and after our first mission, we are basically doing housekeeping and reporting back to Algar, who is the guy that hired us to go out in the first place. Um, it's been really fun. I'm playing a little, little lizard person named Mercus. Uh, and I hope you enjoy that. Hi, Geo. How's it going? Glad to see you again. Um, this week on Patreon, patreon.com slash randwitch is the username down here. I posted about smashed potatoes, a little memory of working in restaurants, uh, comfort food questions that I use to determine menus with my catering clients, and a recipe for mung bean paste while I was discovering a Vietnamese dish called ban bao. Uh, culinary word of the day podcast episode number eight is coming out tomorrow and really fun news i'm working on video versions um that are accessible and have the transcripts in the videos uh with my friend chris depew um and we're going to be uploading those to youtube uh this week which is really really cool uh we do an audio version of the podcast on YouTube for Fun City, and I thought that it would be a good idea for me to do that for Culinary Word of the Day as well, um, so that more people can read it and access it, you know, if you are uh, of the not hearing community. So, really cool development in that regard. Um, we have a Twitter account, Culinary WOTD, and we always need help uh, with coming up with new words to cover. Uh, I'm good. I'm pretty much recorded up to episode 10, but after that, I would love more suggestions for words you want to learn about. Um, what is else is happening? Let's check out what people have been cooking this week. Oh, <laughs> we've got Jeff's... Uh, sorry, apologies for the gross corners of Jeff's legs, but this is Jeff's shrimp burrito. <laughs> Uh, what else did people cook this week? Um, JV sent me this fried egg uh, breakfast. Like, gorgeous light on this. Like, nice egg. Got some sausage and some bell pepper. I hate them, but they still look great. Yeah, nice breakfast, JV. Uh, Lucius went to the market again today. Nice haul. Look at that tiny pie. I think that tiny pie is probably my favorite thing in this. <laughs> so cremini mushrooms. Is it a peach raspberry pie? Adorable. Uh, okra, some oyster mushroom. This is a good haul. And a fish, trout, right? Nice. Nice haul. Yeah, yeah. What else is happening? Vance made an apple Dutch baby. It didn't do the Dutch baby thing. This is just basically a giant pancake. <laughs> giant apple pancake. Uh, what else? Dylan made this. It's not big in real life like this, but it's a breakfast sandwich with bacon, egg, and cheese. Very, very cool. That bacon looks delicious. Yes. What else is happening? Uh, Vance was also grilling some grilled fish with cilantro, lemon, um, some garlic scapes, and corn. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Peter sent this one in. This is uh, egg-flavored potato chips. I believe these are Korean. Yeah, potato snack. Fried egg taste potato chips. Curious about this. Has anyone ever had these egg-flavored chips? I have not. <laughs> um, what have I been up to this week? Let's see. Lots of things. Uh, I learned how to make boba, which was a little difficult at first because 
if you don't boil the water when you're mixing the dough, uh, the tapioca starch turns into this like not quite liquid, not quite liquid, not quite solid solution. Like, you know, if you mix cornstarch with water, it's like this weird, like gloopy situation. So it didn't act, so the water wasn't hot enough to activate the starch. So if you're gonna make tapioca from scratch, you should boil the water and then mix in tapioca starch. And then it will look like this <laughs> after cooking for about 30 minutes. But, um, wow, making your own boba is like very labor intensive. <laughs> uh,. I think for about like three hours of work, I ended up with like a pint, which is two cups of boba or maybe four servings of uh, bubble tea drinks. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. I learned something though. Um, this is a different version of tortang talong, which is a Filipino eggplant omelette. So normally you would take a Japanese eggplant, which is a uh, long and skinny, and you'd broil that, uh, peel it, dip it in some egg and fish sauce, and then fry that on both sides. So that's like an eggplant omelet with the top still attached. Um, the Brooklyn Grange last weekend, which is a, a local garden here or lo a local um, rooftop farm, they were selling baby fairy eggplants at their farm stand. And so I got like a pint of them, broiled all of those, and then started experimenting with different ways I could plate the eggplant omelet and so this is like a flower shape of the baby eggplants with the rest of the excess egg like poured around it like a skirt so this is like a, a eggplant omelet flower thing I don't know I kind of I really like it because you can pick off the eggplants and eat them and then eat the rest of the omelet you know with a fork but I thought it was a fun like I don't know fun exploration of this dish has anyone ever had eggplant omelet? <laughs> um, this was my lunch today. This is andouille sausage ramen. So like, we talked about gumbo so much last week that I wanted to get some andouille sausage, which is a spicy, smoky, like southern sausage in the US. Um, so I just use like instant ramen, you know? Uh, <laughs> And the sausage has a lot of like paprika and, and pepper in it. So it made the broth like cool. and I mean, not cool, but like it made it spicy. Cool as in dope. That's what I mean. Not cool as in temperature. Uh, but I have shiitake mushroom, a tomato my friend Rachel gave me from her rooftop garden, um, and some cured egg and scallion. It's one way to dress up your ramen, right? Yeah. You can still watch Gumbo's stream on the archive. <laughs> um, I learned how to make a uh, kinilao uh, in the Philippines, which is like our version of ceviche. Um, and so I'm testing someone else's recipe that uses fresh coconut. And I can't eat it because I'm allergic. But um, I've been practicing learning thine enemy, which is the humble coconut. Uh, I've been hacking and slashing at these with a mask on and gloves because I'm allergic to it. <laughs> but um, I've developed like a way to crack them open and not hurt myself <laughs> in my backyard. <laughs> uh, it's been fun. <laughs> I made my own hot sauce. This was exciting. Um, a few recipes I had had a lot of excess peppers. So I had like Nardello peppers, I had Fresno, Thai chili, jalapeno. So I, I used them all up. Uh, I fermented them on the counter for a week. So you make this salt brine and chop a bunch of garlic and like leave it at room temperature in with the peppers uh, for a whole week. And so on Sunday, I ground it all up and then sauteed it for 15 minutes to stop the fermentation process. Now I have sort of a chunky all-purpose hot sauce that I use on everything now. It's great. Lovely. Oh, I learned how to make polvoron this week too. If you don't know what this is, this is a Spanish, also Filipino cookie that crumbles as soon as you touch it. <laughs> um, this particular recipe is oat flour, all-purpose flour, black sesame, um, 
butter. And so that's kind of where it gets that short, bready, crumbly texture is from the butter, the butter and flour and sugar. Um, but this is brought me back to my childhood. I used to go to a bakery in Hercules, California. I don't remember the name of the bakery. I remember where it is. As soon as I exit, I know where it is. <laughs> if you ever been to Hercules, California, there's a Filipino bakery in it. I forget what its name is. But I used to buy, what, five for a dollar polvoron. And it's like this, um, it's so powdery and dry that um, when you put it in your mouth, at first you want to cough. But then if your saliva mixes with it, it's like you have been chewing a cookie. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> It's so good. Yeah, we have a ceviche. Kinilao. Yeah. Yeah, these coconuts were pretty tricky to open. Um, after opening four of them, uh, I feel pretty comfortable doing it now. Also, I would like a machete for Christmas. <laughs> that would be so dope. I don't really want to make a habit of, of opening coconuts. Um, but I would love to just own a machete. <laughs> what else did I do this week? Oh, so this is relevant to what we're talking about later. This is Celtus salad. Um, so Celtus is a vegetable that we will be talking about. Um, but I, I made a salad out of it with cilantro, black sesame, sesame oil, and some dill. It was delicious and ref refreshing. It's a good summer dish. If you're not familiar with this vegetable, we will talk about it soon. We will talk about it soon. Okay. How are we doing, friends? Yeah, like a food-specific machete. <laughs> Hi, Hufflepunks. How are you? <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know what I would use the machete for if it wasn't for food. <laughs> for the oncoming zombie apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, you did come in at a weird time. I love it. It's cool. Um, oh, yeah. So, obviously, uh, I've had a few changes myself. I spent last weekend uh, bleaching my hair and, uh, and dyeing it. I did it myself. I haven't, um, I haven't dyed my hair in, like, over a decade, I think. The last time I did it was... I think when I first moved here, so maybe like 2007, 14 years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not much bamboo to cut here in the city or sugarcane, but totally bushwhacking. <laughs> if things get wild in New York, it'd be dope to just have a machete. Um, a lot of friends in California are uh, evacuating their homes because of the fire. And uh, my friend Eric Rude shared the the government's like go bag recommendations and so um i mean i've always had like some emergency supplies but i every week i'm gonna start like putting something in the go bag so like batteries and maybe machete will be on my eventually list <laughs> oh your grandpa had a machete huh dang that sounds cool I want to have a, one day have a backyard that is wild enough for me to warrant the use of a machete. <laughs> All right. Well, friends, let's get started. So last week, I, I went through the very long, very, very long history of spices. Um, and to recap, there are some fundamental differences between spices and herbs. You'll tend to store them together, like in dry storage in the pantry. Uh, but spices are more on the seed and parts of the plant, like hardier parts of the plant end of the spectrum. And herbs are the soft, stemmy, leaf part of a plant. So spices can include rhizomes or roots like turmeric and ginger. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they tend to have strong flavors. They're used in small quantities. They tend to add only very few calories to food. Um, but some spices, especially those made from seeds, uh, they contain high portions of fat, protein, and carbohydrate by weight. That means in bulk. But a little at a time, they're not really adding much except for aroma and flavor 
for you and for your enjoyment of the dish. Yeah. What? You grew up with machetes in the house? Damn. Hardcore. I love this. I love this machete talk. Um, so, so, so. Most herbs and spices have substantial antioxidant activity. Uh, one study found that cumin and fresh ginger to have the highest antioxidant activity. So that's why you will see uh, cumin and fresh ginger and sometimes turmeric in health food drinks. Um, there needs to be more research about this, but it's definitely very, very trendy to uh, use those things in, uh, in health drinks. And let me see here. I actually have some pilot kombucha, uh, celery juniper. This is what I'm drinking today. This has tea, sugar, juniper, celery seed, which is uh, I'm about to talk about too, and some organic lemon peel. All right. Uh, last time we talked about, you know, spices at large and sort of where they come from. But right now I'm going to talk about uh, specific spices. So I did mention this already, but for those of you who missed it last time, uh, saffron is one of the most expensive spices in the world and it's due to its cultivation process and uh yeah it's just a very labor intensive spice um it's so laborious there are only three little red stigma um the little like threads of saffron there's only three per crocus flower. These grow on crocus flowers. Like that little hairy, like red thing that comes out of a flower, that's the stigma. And every crocus flower only has three of them. And so it takes about 4,000 stigma to produce one ounce of saffron. So if you look at a store and you're trying to buy saffron by the pound, it's gonna be hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And so it's only sold in grams. Kind of like drugs, right? <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, you're right. Um, shot of turmeric is I intense. It can be a little chalky if you have too much. I had a friend who um, was trying to eat a spoonful every day and uh, convinced me to try it one time. And I, it's so dry. It's so dry and chalky. It's better to drink turmeric. It's way better to drink and eat it on like cooked food than eating spoonfuls of it. Um, because I coughed pink powder, no, pink powder, yellow powder everywhere. Everywhere. Mm. Okay. I know. Do not eat spoonfuls of turmeric. So coriander, how many of you know what coriander is? Coriander is the seed of cilantro so those two are very very close um closely related flavor wise and plant wise but sometimes if i see a recipe that has only coriander or only cilantro i know that the other one will pair well with it because they're from the same plant and um just because from the they're the from the same plant doesn't mean they taste exactly the same so Last time when we talked about the difference between spices and herbs, coriander is a dry spice. It's a seed. Cilantro is the flowering, like, leafy plant. So the spice will have more volatile oil in it and, like, more of a mellow taste. And the cilantro will have a more zesty, fresh taste. So why not use them together? Makes sense. Um, but they're, you know, they're wildly different. But they come from the same plant. It's great. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Coriander. It's an annual shrub cultivated for its aromatic seeds, like I said, uh, used as a condiment or for medicinal use as a carminative. What's a carminative? I want to look up what carminative is. And a stimulant. I didn't realize that coriander was known as a stimulant. Ah, this is funny. We're learning a new word. Carminative is an herb or preparation intended to either prevent formation of gas in the gastrointestinal tract or facilitate the expulsion of said gas, thereby combating flatulence. <laughs> that was the most academic... <laughs> that was the most 
<laughs> academic explanation of a anti-gas medicine. <laughs> I didn't realize <laughs> coriander was a carminative. That's really funny because coriander and cumin are two of the spices that you would have in tacos, right? Or in a lot of like Latin American food. Um, and there's a stereotype that beans make you toot. But if cilantro is there, it's an anti-gas thing, wouldn't it balance it out? I mean, maybe you aren't having as much coriander to uh, completely X it out, X out the however many beans. Um, but that's really funny that they they molecularly work together that way. <laughs> that's a new word for us. Carminative. C-A-R-M-I-N-A-T-I-V-E. An herb or pre preparation that prevents gas. <laughs> oh, good to know. You know, if you're feeling particularly gassy, have some coriander. <laughs> I love that. A carminative. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, coriander was cultivated in Greece as early as the 2nd millennium BC, and even though it originally came from uh, the West Asia or North Africa region, ancient tablets talk of its use in perfumes as well as, as a spice, obviously, um, in cooking. <laughs> so, this species is particularly opposed to hot weather, um, which mildews the coriander leaf. If you've ever had coriander or um, cilantro in your fridge for over a week, you'll notice that the leaves start to get mildew. So it doesn't like hot weather. It also was cultivated for its medicinal cooling effects when applied to bread or to an ulcer and for expelling worms when mixed with wine. Expelling worms. Interesting. I guess it's because their uh, food storage back then, um, you know, wasn't a closed container. You know, just have a pitcher of wine. Or barrels of wine, and to get rid of bugs, uh, they would add coriander. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. <laughs> so capers technically are uh, seeds or unopened flower buds. Um, it's a biennial sh spiny shrub. They bear round, fleshy leaves and big pinkish white flowers. So the spice is native to the Greek islands and grows in rocky coastal areas. Great. Um, there's very few preservatives back in the ancient times, so capers were cultivated for their pickling qualities. Um, you can store capers in a bunch of salt and they'll last forever. All you have to do is rehydrate them. Um, let's see. The earliest found reference and use comes from Greece in the 7th century BC. Uh, let's see. However, the beginning of the intentional cultivation of capers is unclear, dated to any time between the 4th century and 1st century. Whoa. No one exactly knows where capers come from, y'all. Or when co capers come from. But I didn't really classify them as a spice. It's fascinating. So, opium poppy. That's an annual plant with white spotted petals, large ovoid capsule native to the Iberian Peninsula. I didn't know that opium originated in Spain. Interesting. The spice comes from the oil released by the poppy seed during a cold cold press. Uh, the seeds are steeped in warm water to make a tea for medicinal purpose of calming a cough. Didn't know that. Huh. Celery, also a spice. Um, it's native to the Mediterranean region, uh, grows close to the sea or in moist places. It's harvested for its vegetative body. That's the vegetable that we know as celery. Um, and the seeds are used for flavorings and medicinal use as a <laughs> cure for kidney stones. My goodness. Oh, your dad dislikes capers. He calls them rabbit poo. Oh, too salty for him, maybe. They're just really salty. Um, the earliest known Greek use of celery was in the 9th century BC. Other medicinal uses of celery include uh, regulatory effects. That is the most PC way <laughs> to say uh, gastro gastrointestinal health. There are just so many good words we're discovering today. Carminative and good regulatory effects. <laughs> 
Um, celery is also known as a soporific drug. Does anyone remember what that word means? Soporific? It's from Beatrix Potter book. Uh, uh, soporific means makes you sleepy. And also from You've Got Mail. <laughs> I think, right? Soporific? I don't remember. No, it's not from You've Got Mail. It's from Wit. It's a play. Apparently, celery is supposed to make you sleepy, but uh, unproven. I think that's just an ancient folk rem remedy. I think celery contains so little material that your body thinks it's tired <laughs> from digesting it. <laughs> that's my theory. I remember in high school science, they told us that um, celery has negative calories because it just takes so much work to digest. It's very fibrous. Yeah. It, celery is negative three calories. <laughs> That's perhaps why it made people sleepy because it has no real nutritional value. <laughs> just water and fiber. <laughs> it's really funny. Um, okay, getting into more spices that we mentioned last week. Somebody mentioned caraway seed. Excuse me. So, caraway seed. This plant is similar in appearance to other members of the carrot family. It has finely divided feathery leaves with thread-like divisions. The etymology of caraway is complex and poorly understood, just like a lot of these spices. Oh my god. Caraway has been called by many different names in different regions. Uh, to derive from the Latin cuminum, uh, <laughs> which means cumin. <laughs> caraway looks like cumin, but is absolutely nothing like it. Uh, the Greek caron, uh, K-A-R-O-N, also means cumin. Uh, it was adapted into Latin as carum, uh, which now means caraway. So it used to be cuminum because it looks like cumin but it is its own thing now called carum. Um, yes. But other times, people mistake it for a fennel seed. Like, cumin, fennel, and caraway all kind of look the same, but aromatically are very, very different. Um, the English use of the term caraway dates back to uh, 1440, which is pretty late considering all the other spices we've spoken about so far have been... 2nd century, 7th century, like, seems like caraway came out uh, a little later. Oh, wait, here, here, here. We have um, Greek mention, but no time period associated with it. So caraway was mentioned by Greek Dioscorides as an herb and a tonic. Uh, later mentioned in uh, the Roman Apicus as an ingredient in recipes. Um, in the Arab world, it was known as Karawiya and cultivated in Morocco. Very nice. I did not know that there was a caraway fruit. Did you know there was a caraway fruit? I didn't realize that there was, um, there's images here. This is what caraway looks like. It's better to eat nothing than eat celery. Haha. <laughs> I mean, some people enjoy the flavor of celery. I like celery soda and celery juice when it's mixed with cocktails. Ooh, no raisins for me. Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, continuing with caraway, um, I didn't know there was a caraway fruit. But has anyone ever had a caraway fruit? Apparently, it is uh, has a pungent anise-like flavor, like a fennel. Caraway is used in desserts, liquors, casseroles, and other foods. Its leaves can be added to salads, stews, and soups. I've never seen fresh caraway again. Wow. I wonder if it's just a European thing. Um, Finland, okay, this explains it. Finland su supplies about 28% of the world's caraway production, uh, with 1,500 farms. Uh, high output occurring possibly from its favorable climate and latitudes, which ensures long summer hours of sunlight. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, wow, I guess caraway is very popular in Finland. <coughs> I have never heard of caraway vegetable caraway vegetable googling it now it doesn't show it so weird oh it looks like a um it looks like a, a parsnip basically interesting interesting <coughs> moving on to star anise 
This is one that I have in my pantry. I use a lot. Look at how pretty it is. Isn't it pretty? Elysium verum, or verum, sorry. Elysium Elis verum. It's a medium-sized evergreen tree native to northeast Vietnam and southwest China. Um, it's also called uh, anise seed, Chinese star anise, or badian. Uh, wow. Interesting. Star anise oil is highly fragrant and used in cooking, perfumery, soaps, toothpaste, mouthwashes, and skin creams. Anything that is anise flavored is probably star anise or fennel. Depends. 90% uh, of the world's star anise crop is used for extraction of shikimic acid, a chemical intermediate used in the synthesis of oseltamivir. This is really crazy. 90% of the world's star anise crop is not used for culinary. It is to make Tamiflu. Do you know what Tamiflu is? Tamiflu is a new commercial drug to treat the flu. It's a prescription drug. 90% of the world's star anise crop goes to making flu medicine. That's insane. 10% is what we use culinarily. What a crazy fact. I think that's really crazy. Wow. So the Latin name Elysium comes from uh, Elysio, meaning entice. Uh, the name Badian appears to derive from French Badian. Uh, and uh, it means eight horns. Even though I don't, it doesn't look like it has eight. One, two, three, four, five. Oh my gosh, it has eight. I didn't realize. I can't count, obviously. Yes, it is excellent for mold wine, but a little goes a long way. What spice do they call rocket in Australia? What do you mean rocket? I've only ever heard of um, arugula being called rocket. And some people conflate that with wasabi. But I don't know if there's another one called rocket. Oh, yeah, it is arugula. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> uh, okay. Moving on. Star anise contains anethyl, the same compound that gives the unre unrelated anise its flavor. So star anise and fennel share a same compound that they have a flavor in common, but they're not the same seed. So fennel seed and star anise are two different seeds but they do share a same chemical compound that makes people think that they're the same thing <laughs> so star anise is coming to the west as a less expensive substitute for fennel or anise in baking as well as in liquor production um especially in the production of a liquor called galliano which i've never had i think galliano is the one that's in a very skinny tall bottle at the bar uh, let's see, it's used in biryani, in masala chai, uh, in Malay, Chinese cooking, Indonesian cuisine. Uh, it's widely grown for commercial use in China, India, uh, all over the place. And one of the main ingredients of five spice powder, which is something we're going to talk about in a second. Um, it's a major ingredient in pho in Vietnamese noodle soup. Uh, like you mentioned earlier in the chat, it's part of mulled wine or vin chowd. Um... And they have a suggestion here, uh, steep some in coffee. Interesting. So the pods can be used in this manner multiple times by the potful or a cup. So you only need one little star for a pot of coffee. Interesting. Oh yeah, you could steep it like tea. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So uh, there are a few varieties that are poisonous and that you should not use. So Japanese star anise. Um, it's a similar tree, but it's highly toxic and inedible. Do not harvest it on your own in Japan. <laughs> it's a different variety. Um, instead, there it is burned as incense. It can cause like serious neurological problems if you, um, if you consume Japanese star anise. Yo, 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 yo. It has a neurotoxin called anisatin. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Um, there's also one found in the southern U.S. It's called Swamp Star or Illicium Ili Ili Pavlorum. <laughs> oh my god, I can't say that. 
Illichium parviflorum. There you go. Uh, and it also has a high level of toxicity and should not be used for any remedies or cooking. Ooh, but it is great to burn as incense as well. <laughs> So, somebody mentioned Chinese Five Spice last stream. Um, this is a mix that I use a lot. I love it. I love it. Love it for a traditional barbecue. Um, I highly, highly recommend having Chinese Five Spice in your cabinet. Um, it's very warm. It You can put it pretty much on any meat or any kind of protein. Uh, the main ingredients of the spice, um, Five Spice are um, star anise, which we just talked about, cloves, cinnamon, uh, Sichuan pepper, which is the pink peppercorn, and fennel seeds. So it's called Five Spice, but depending on where you're from in China, uh, the recipe varies, obviously. Um, so it still has five spices, but it may swap out one thing for another. So um, they might have ginger, nutmeg, turmeric, um, cardamom, licorice, uh, orange peel, or even galangal. Keen last week in the chat was talking about galangal, so this would be a good way to use up the galangal that he has in the in the pantry. Um, <laughs> so five spice uh, is great with fatty meats, especially especially pork and duck. Yes, it's a spice rub. Um, you can add it to breading for frying foods. You can use it in soup. You can broil chicken with it. Um, yeah, yeah. I love it. I my favorite recipe that I've used it on has been uh, ribs, like slow slow cooked ribs. Hell yeah! In Hawaii, some restaurants even place a shaker of Five Spice on uh, the table, just like as a you know thing to have. It's pretty awesome. Excuse me. And if you have Five Spice, you can make a finishing salt out of it by mixing. Um, uh, maybe one tablespoon to two tablespoons. So one tablespoon of five spice to two tablespoons kosher salt. Heat that up in a, in a dry pan for like a minute until you hear it, in, until you smell it. <laughs> Synesthesia, until you hear it smelling. <laughs> until you smell it, like until it becomes fragrant because uh, heating up spices brings out their volatile oils. And when they bring out the volatile oils... Um, it is, it can better adhere to salt or meats or whatever. So toast your spices before you use them or before you grind them. Uh, that is all about very specific spices, my friends. Yeah. Let me see. Do I have any others here? So that was star anise. Uh, this is what saffron looks like. Let's see if we can zoom in here. Because every crocus plant has only three of these little threads. And this is a whole spoonful. This is like $10. $10, $15, easily. <laughs> Insane. Can you imagine how long it took to just pick off all of those and then dry them? Insane. Let's see. Uh, at the top here, we have turmeric. On the right, we have paprika. And on the left, I'm not so sure. I didn't take that photo. Uh, those are spices, friends. If you have any more spices that you want to talk about next week, I will happily find more information for you. But for now, let's put an egg on me. What kind of egg should we put? I got poached egg, fried egg, omelet, hard-boiled egg. While I get ready for the next little part, celtus. Celtus is the next thing we're going to talk about. What kind of egg should I put on the screen? Poached. You got it. Poached egg. There it is. All right, I'm going to take a quick drink of this kombucha. You hate a hard-boiled egg. Well, it hates you, too. <laughs> Why do you hate hard-boiled eggs? I totally understand how someone wouldn't like eggs. They can be pretty polarizing. I did not like eggs until my 20s. So I know I know where that's coming from. Okay. I also have a strawberry snack here for myself. I want this one actually. 
You like a soft or medium boil? Word. Yeah, more than 7.30 is a chalk. Yeah. I get what you mean. I do like a, a gooey a gooey yolk. Jammy yolk is, is where it's at. Is anyone else snacking on stuff right now in the chat? I got strawberries and kombucha. Yeah, hard yolks are good for egg, um, egg salad sandos. I agree. But I recently, um, I've, I had like a Japanese egg sandwich, which uses really, really fluffy milk bread and more of a wet egg mixture with um, kewpie mayo, like a little bit of sugar. It's pretty good. Hey, Tris, haven't seen you in a minute. Bounty bar, dark and iced coffee with creamy oat. <laughs> oh, that's what you got for your snack. Nice. You're having a coffee right now? It's 545. Oh, congrats. You moved. I gotta text you about that. I'm glad your internet works. I hope your computer is also holding up okay. I remember last time your computer almost shorted out. <laughs> when you were trying to watch a stream. How are you? Oh, okay, so life updates, Tris. I dyed my hair. And this is a stream exclusive. All of you are hearing this for the first time. I'm saying it out loud. I got a tattoo. And it's on my arm. I don't know if you can see that. It's the word fine backwards. Because things are not fine. <laughs> uh, you had to buy a new computer. Oh, my God. Um, but back to my tattoo, I got it in red, it's in red ink, it's still healing a little bit, um, I really liked getting a tattoo, um, uh, Enif, or Fine Backwards, is an inside joke with my uncle who passed away last year, um, when I was little, this went on for most of my life, like, whenever I saw him, he'd be like, how are you, like, how are you, Jennifer, and I'd be like, I'm fine. You know, like a resigned teenager, I'd be like, I'm fine. Like, you don't want to talk about it. Um, he'd always call me out. He'd be like, no, you're not just fine. You're enif. Because to him, uh, I was more than fine all the time, which was very sweet, right? I think um, I'm going to try to convince all my brother, my, my brother and my cousins to, like, get the same tattoo. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I really liked the experience. Um... When I was speaking to the tattoo artist about it, she knew it was like my first one. And um, she's like, I'm curious to see how you feel about it. Like, I'm going to give you one little poke and you tell me, you know, if that sucks or not. And I'm like, okay. And I was like bracing myself for the worst thing. And uh, I was staring at her aquarium. Like she had this, this great aquarium with a giant koi fish. I think her koi fish was like nine years old. Like it was a this big it's like a big fish so I was staring at this fish while she was um gonna tattoo me and I like barely felt it it was like a little like a little ouchy tickle but like not enough for me to really like uh, to reel back in pain um so I think on my spectrum of 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 pain that I've experienced in my life I think going to the dentist is much worse Definitely going to the dentist is much worse than a tattoo. And I guess it also depends where you're getting the tattoo. Like, I got it on the inside of my arm, uh, which is a little tender, but, um, I mean, if it were on a bone or, like, on my shoulder, that would hurt probably much more, right? Uh, but it was a good experience. It was less than 40 minutes for the whole experience, and it's a local place that I wanted to support. Um, there was no one else in the in the parlor with me. It was just me and the tattoo artist, so I felt really safe. Um, but yeah, that's what the experience of my first tattoo. <laughs> Thanks, Gio. It is a very wholesome story, isn't it? I, uh, I miss my uncle very much. But this is like one way, you know. Keep him alive. What's up? <laughs> I don't know. I've never had a tattoo. Uh, and I've always like, built it up in my mind. Like, I think the, the thing that held me back was not knowing what I wanted, but... I think when I revisited the idea 
during quarantine, like the, the the urge got bigger and bigger, you know, uh, to to want it, and I really like narrowed it down. There are definitely more things that I want to get. Like I definitely want to get more eggs. I want to get an egg. Like maybe I'll get the fried egg. Maybe not in pixel form because that might hurt. <laughs> might just do a simple outline. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was a good experience. I think I might do an egg on my shoulder. That'd be funny, right? And then, Tris, you and I still have to go get a cilantro, right? We want to get a cilantro. Especially since we talked about cilantro for so long earlier. Okay, enough tattoo talk. I will, I will happily answer tattoo questions later if you have them. Uh... But let's move on to the second subject of today, which is Celtus. How many of you in the chat have had Celtus? Not celery, not lettuce, Celtus. C-E-L-T-U-C-E. -E. Yeah, Geo, nice tattoo artists are great. This one was very, very kind to me. <laughs> okay, who has and who hasn't had Celtus? Oh, sorry, I didn't change the title of the stream. We're not talking about gumbo again. <laughs> We're talking currently about Celtus. So you've never heard of it, right? Okay. So let, let me show you what it is. So Celtus... Oops, no, I grabbed the wrong image. There. Move. So it is... It is also a plant, like a lettuce-like plant up top, but it's mostly used for the bottom, for the root. So this is one version of it. These are pretty thick um, compared to the ones I've seen in New York. Um, this is what it looks like when you trim it. And I'll talk about trimming it in a second, but let's, let's look at the Celtus for a while. It does kind of look like pechai. It is sort of celery lettuce. So, Celtus is also called stem lettuce, celery lettuce, asparagus lettuce, or Chinese lettuce. Um, it's a cultivar of lettuce grown primarily for the thick, the thick stem. Um, you might also see it at Chinese grocery stores as Wosun, W-O-S-U-N. Um, so, it's a vegetable. It's especially popular in both mainland China and Taiwan. Um, the stem is called, is also called King Sun. Uh, so Wo Sun and King Sun are two different words you might see, uh, for this vegetable. So Wo Sun, the whole thing with the leaf and the root and just the root King Sun. So Q-I-N-G-S-U-N. So the leaves, those are tender. Um, the white stems can be eaten raw. Uh, as long as you peel off the outer layers first to reveal that lovely green translucent interior like that. Yeah. But at least in the stores that I've been to, uh, they haven't sold the greens. They only sell the, the stem. I keep calling it a root. It's not a root. I'm sorry. It's a, it's a stem. Um, so it can be pickled, it can be grilled, it can be roasted, it can be stir-fried. Uh, the flavor, raw, is mild but nutty. It has a slightly smoky aftertaste, even though it is not cooked. Whoa. Um, it's thought to have originated in the Mediterranean region and then brought to China during the Tang Dynasty, about 600 to 900 AD. Interesting. Who is Mr. B who is Mr. Big? Who's calling me sis? Hello. Who is that? <laughs> All right. So Celtus, um, when you're shopping for it, make sure you choose one that has a sturdy stem. Uh, bumps are okay. That just means that's where the leaves used to be and they've just been trimmed off. Um, they should have slightly green tops. Uh, it's okay if they look fresh. Um, don't buy the stem or leaves if they're limp or squishy. Um, avoid any Celtus that is yellowing or has dark spots on the stems or leaves. 
So how do you store it when you get it home? You cut off the tops and keep them separate from the stems. Uh, the stems you can store in uh, separate Ziplocs or airtight, you know, um, Tupperwares uh, in the crisper drawer of the fridge. Um, they will keep for about two to three days. But if you're like me and can't get to things that quickly, um, you can revive them. After you prep them, they get a little, um, they might be a little squishy. But uh, as long as they're not like... Uh, disintegrating squishy if they're a little soft like a, an old carrot um, they can still be revived in some ice water so uh, the stem of the seltzer should be peeled of its tough exterior uh, use a peeler or a knife um, so that dark brown peels away um, you might be able to just pull it off too uh, it can be very fibrous um, the interior is very surprisingly crisp delicate and mild and this beautiful green Beautiful, beautiful green. Um, dum, dum, dum. It, it kind of has like a little bit of a jicama uh, texture, if you know, if, if you've ever had that, or water chestnut crispness. Uh, but it doesn't taste like those things. <laughs> so I ate one raw uh, yesterday. Let me go back to that photo. I think it was here. Here we go. This was my cell to salad. So... Um, I peeled the whole root, uh, cut it into like four sections, like four batons, and then slice those into planks and then julienne the planks. And so it's like, um, I've got like a noodle-y situation here. You can take it to a spiralizer, you can use a grater, um, you can use the peeler to make ribbons. Uh, you can also slice it into coins or any other shapes that you can think of, but it's, you know, it's just like a, it's like a carrot, so, um... You can use your imagine, imagination. Um, so this preparation is tossed with sesame oil, uh, black sesame seeds, dill, and cilantro. So this was a very easy, quick side dish for me to do. Um, highly recommend using seltus if you see it in the store. It's not very expensive. Um, it's great. Uh, la, 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 la. So it's a little nutty. So it pairs well with um, Chinese flavors, so like Five Spice, obviously. Um, it plays well with Mediterranean flavors as well. It pairs well with walnuts, lemon, and olive oil. Uh, it has a crunch like radish, cucumber, or carrot. Um, and those are the kinds of the places that you can use it as well. So like in a slaw or on toast, like, you know, if you had buttered radish on toast, you could have uh, buttered toast with like celtus. Or like a crudite plate um, with cell juice. Look really cool. Would look really cool. Um, let's see. According to William, Women's Health, cell juice is low in calories, but it's packed with vitamins and minerals, including iron, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, vitamin C, and B. Whoa. It's an excellent source of manganese, which is important for metabolism, calcium absorption, and regulating blood sugars. Just one cup of Celtus provides 30% of the daily value. Yo. Yo, that's cool. Um, if you're cooking it, try it in a stir fry or stew. Um, what else? Anywhere where you use carrot, kohlrabi, radish, cucumber. Uh, it also pairs well, like I said, walnuts earlier, lemon, uh, dairy, tomatoes, vinaigrettes, eggs, and fish. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Um, if you're thinking of, like, improvisation with this dish, think about, like, cool, refreshing. It's definitely a very summer, cold preparation kind of vegetable. Um, it likes to be shaved with a mandolin, you know, into a slaw, or tossed with oil-based dressings dash of something sweet, like a pinch of, of sugar in there. Wow. Um, it kind of smells sometimes like sunflower seeds, if you can imagine. Um, what else? Uh, in the Omnivore's Cookbook, you can I'll, I can share this link here. Omnivore's Cookbook. There is a cell to stir fry with eggs. I'm going to share this link here. Always need things to pair with infinite number of melons your CSA gives you. Yeah, an unripe melon can actually act like Celtus. So here's a recipe for Celtus stir fry with eggs. This recipe is really cute. It has um, 
diamond shaped seltus. I've never actually seen anyone slice vegetables that way. It's pretty cool. Try that out. All right. That is all I have about seltus, my friends. Anyone have any questions? Do we have questions? Cooking questions, general cooking questions, ones that I can answer quickly. I'm gonna eat this strawberry. Mm. So, we're getting to the portion of the stream where we pretend we're on Chopped. So friends, if you're new to the stream, we get, like to use maybe 10, 15 minutes to work together and pretend we're on that show Chopped. In the chat, if you would like to suggest three or four ingredients, so uh, everybody shout out an ingredient that we want to put in the chopped basket, and then all of us will work together to uh, pretend make dishes from it. Uh, you can uh, use as many or as little of the ingredients as you want, and uh, we will try to imagine and stretch possibilities of what these ingredients are. The stream went by fast. It's been an hour. I start at five. <laughs> popcorn. Okay. Thank you, Martin, for popcorn. All right. Maybe two or three more ingredients or yeah, two or three more ingredients that we can mash up and pretend we're on chopped with friends. Feel free to suggest anything. Throw us a curveball. That's the whole point, right? We're trying to, to imagine possibilities and maybe inspire some dinner tonight. <laughs> habaneros okay popcorn habaneros well maybe if someone else suggests something else we might knock out mint jelly i want to give someone an opportunity okay popcorn and habaneros mint jelly unless someone else has another suggestion i want to include more people <laughs> <laughs> I'm also not attached to mint jelly. I'd like to give someone else a chance to suggest something. Anyone else has another suggestion? Whole grain cereal. Okay, this is interesting. Okay, we've got popcorn, habaneros, whole grain cereal. This is fascinating. So, popcorn obviously can be popped. But I've also heard of people um, grinding popcorn into flour, corn flour or grits. Um, habaneros, they're very spicy peppers. They can be grilled. They can be pickled to take away some of that heat. They can be sauteed. They can be made into a hot sauce. Whole grain cereal um, can be ground up. We can do um, granola. You can... Uh, rehydrate it actually to make um, like a, a bread slurry not necessarily bread yet but some kind of bread slurry to to uh, add some heft to something but um, okay so let's see so far what we've got popcorn habaneros whole grain cereal the very easy thing to say is um, habanero flavored popcorn so we dehydrate the habaneros Pulverize it into a powder, sift it over the popcorn with some butter. Great. Um, whole grain cereal. We could do spicy, savory cereal. Oh my god, that sounds crazy, but also something I would try. Um, we could do fried chicken or chicken tenders, you know, spicy chicken tenders. We, we do... Um, the cereal crust on the outside of some chicken and then do a habanero buffalo sauce. So we make a hot sauce out of the habanero, add a little butter, and then dip the finished fried chicken tenders in it. That'd be yum. So popcorn you can grind into grits, essentially, and we can make uh, 
traditional grits, habanero spicy grits with like whole grain cereal crumble on top. We could do um, grit cakes. We could do uh, cornbread. It'll be a really rustic, like chunky cornbread, but it's still cornbread, right? What else? Does anyone else have any ideas on how we can combine popcorn habaneros and whole grain cereal? We could make um, meatballs. We could do ground beef with the whole grain cereal mixed in. Um, that is very reminiscent of a, a meatball called kibbe, which has uh, whole grains in it. <laughs> yeah, Chopped is a very wild show for sure. I get a lot of inspiration from when I used to watch that kind of stuff. I don't really have TV or cable, so <laughs> I prefer to imagine in my mind. <laughs> Anyone else have some ideas on how we can combine popcorn, habanero, and whole grain cereal? Um, we can obviously do burgers. We could do... I, I want to think of something sweet we can make. What do you think habanero ice cream would be like? Be scary? <gasps> no, you know what? We could do margaritas. We could do habanero margaritas. Side of popcorn. Not incorporated into the dish, though. Um, you could do... Whole grain cereal. We could do candied habanero as an ice cream topping. Do a simple sugar syrup and, like... Cook it, cook the habaneros down in it and then dry. Yeah, granola-like snack. Habanero, whole grain cereal, popcorn. Ooh, we could do like popcorn balls, like Rice Krispie balls, but they're like spicy. Yeah, habanero margarita with popcorn salt rim. Hell yeah, Tris. There you go. You know what? I'm going to try to like remember these so that we can... um make them someday. That'd be funny, right? If we made them. <laughs> Let's see. I saved that. Habanero margarita with popcorn salt rim. That sounds really fun. Uh, for those of you just joining us, we're trying to mash up the idea of popcorn, habanero peppers, and whole grain cereal. But yeah, you could do like a Rice Krispie treat situation. You could dehydrate the habaneros. Okay, what if what about a soup? Let's see. We could do like a kanji with the whole grain cereal. And then do pickled habanero on top. Some crumbled popcorn, garlic popcorn, crispy garlic. Okay. Yeah. Um, fish. You think we could do like a corn, popcorn coated fish? We could do habanero oil. We could do, I'm trying to think of all the condom condiments you could make. Habanero salsa, obviously. Mmm, guac. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you just made some. Okay. <laughs> you made some popcorn? What did you just make? Or habanero salsa. That's awesome. Otherwise. Oh, very nice. Yum. Taco night. Hell yeah, taco night. I mean, if you really were committing and didn't have, like, the time limit of, of chopped, you could make uh, corn corn taco shells from the popcorn if you really were dedicated <laughs> and didn't have a time limit that's the beauty of these mental exercises right we don't have a time limit we're not actually on chopped and don't have 30 minutes we have all the time in the world it's just uh, exploring the possibility of what it could be my friend Matt Timms and um, Rachel Wharton had a radio show called Mind Kitchen and they would do exactly this and uh, I think the one time I was on their show, they, they told me that I had a whole goat. And I was like, how long can I keep the goat alive? They were like, as long as you want. And I was like, okay, I have a lot of goat milk. 
<laughs> so you can totally apply that kind of outlandish thinking to this exercise too, you know? Like, I can plant the popcorn seeds and grow more corn. <laughs> but, you know, thinking about that stuff, like, gets us to think about our food systems and, and where things come from. So I think that in, in the end, it's, it's a fun thing to do. Does anyone else have any final ideas on how to combine popcorn, habanero peppers, and whole grain cereal? These are all great ideas so far. Just last call for ideas, friends. <laughs> well, then we will wrap up this section of the stream. Uh, so for next time, friends, next Wednesday, uh, what would you like to talk about? Um, some things people mentioned last week were more spices that they mentioned, like ranch or allspice, the history of Lowry's, uh, or we can move on to other subjects. I, I will happily talk about anything next week. So what, what do we want to hear about on the stream next week? Uh, do you have a cooking question? Do you have a recipe that you've always wanted to try but too, were too afraid to tackle? Um, I can always dissect big recipes so that it, it sounds easier. Or ways to modify things, like if you have a specific diet or if you're allergic to something. Um, but there's always something you've always wanted to try, like how can you still make it and it be successful? Let me know. Let me know in the chat. Or you can tweet me at Randwitches. This is my username. Uh... Or you can DM me on Instagram with questions that you have. Okay, seeds. We can do the seeds. For people who don't like melons a lot, what the hell do we do with them when we get them in the CSA? Cantaloupe in particular. Yeah, Martin also has this problem. Yeah, we can talk about melons. Cantaloupe in particular. Okay, yes. Off topic, but you read about the Bon Appetit situation I talked about. Yes, it's a mess, isn't it? It's still ongoing. Yeah. <laughs> Combined, across the country, Tris and Martin have lots of CSA melons. Okay, I'm going to copy that. Seeds. All right. Yeah, melons and seeds. Let's talk about that next week. That sounds right. Okay. Good call, friends. Oh, eating a whole melon makes your teeth hurt too. You should just start freezing them. You can have melon shake. <laughs> oh. oh, your freezer is full of melon. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Maybe you can start making some melon condiment and give it to your friends. <laughs> Three melons cut up in your freezer. Okay, okay. We'll try to figure out how to use up all your melon. That's really funny. I'm sorry. Maybe you can juice it. Like, blend it up in your blender and then um, use a cheesecloth to get all the juice out. Does anyone else have any last minute quick cooking questions? Just little ones. Happy to stick around here for another couple minutes to answer like little questions. You need uses for chia and flax. I feel like we may have addressed chia on a previous stream um, as egg substitute. Uh, I think there are lots of recipes for flax crackers as well. Yeah, chia and flax. Well, we can revisit it as well. Chia and flax. Cool. Um, yeah, chia and flax are definitely egg substitutes, but what I've seen so far, chia is more used in like breakfast pudding situations, like uh, in place of yogurt. Uh, flax. I've just seen in baking mostly, like in crackers and in breads. 
Like as an additive, not necessarily as like a main thing. I, I don't really have a lot of experience with flax, but I know that it is a suitable egg substitute for things. Okay, my friends, I'm gonna take off, but thanks for hanging out today on this Wednesday, this lovely Wednesday. I hope you have a great rest of the week. Um, please feel free to message me. Again, this is my social down here with any cooking questions you have. Um, if you have photos you wanna share with me, uh, you can tag me on Instagram or Twitter. I will happily uh, share them on the stream. I love showing off what my friends are cooking. And if you have any cooking trouble through the week, uh, feel free to ask me questions and I'll help you troubleshoot. That is what I'm here for. Uh, check out all the links below to see how you can support me or subscribe to this channel. Uh, otherwise, I will see you next Wednesday, hopefully on Sunday when I talk about zines. Friends, have a good rest of your Wednesday, okay?